the other thing I wanted to go through fairly quickly is the new breast ovarian pancreatic guidelines were just released a few days ago. So to give a few highlights of some of the changes um, in, in terms of uh, testing choices and considerations that a clinician may have, um, there are, is some guidance about choosing uh, what factors may go into choosing a lab, including what analyses do they perform? You know, is there assistance for cascade testing for relatives? They also, we also, um, in these uh, NCCN guidelines, talk about polygenic risk scores, recognizing that, you know, this is something that is often readily available through certain labs. And just outlining that there are significant limitations in interpretation. And at this point, I think really caution should be exercised with using this type of information for clinical management. And then uh, VUS testing in family members really is not generally clinically um, indicated, which was already in the guidelines, but the exception is unless data exists to support discrepancy in results interpretation, again, that we are all very familiar with because labs don't always agree on interpretations of these results. Um, we also um, went through some changes to the testing criteria. Uh, cribiform histology for prostate cancer is now included, and the probability model, the one included before was PEN2, and that was removed, and CAN risk was added. And the added um, advantage of CAN risk is that this model does include factoring in results of other non BRCA genes. For example, PALB2 is part of the CAN risk model as well. Um, when looking at the breast cancer testing criteria, uh, the degree of relationship, first and second degree relatives with breast cancer stayed the same, but now all grades of prostate cancer are included for inclusion when you're considering um, the history. Uh, for prostate cancer, uh, any NCCN group with specified family history, so not just high grade, and what was narrowed here is in the past, second and third degree relatives um, of a proband could be included, but now that's been narrowed to just first degree relatives. Same goes for pancreatic cancer. For uh, gene specific risks and management, for NBN, again, this does not happen very often, but it was actually downgraded. So there is no evidence for increased risk other than for the Slavic founder mutation. And even for this mutation, there's mixed evidence. There have been a bunch of papers, including those led by Fergus Couch, that have really not shown this increased risk for this, for even this um, Slavic founder mutation. So based on this data and insufficient evidence to support high risk, high cancer risk, high risk breast cancer screening for this gene was removed from the guidelines. For BARD1, the um, guidelines were upgraded is the way I think about it. So um, there was an addition of consideration for high-risk breast screening starting at age 40. For RAD51C and RAD51D, um, in the past, it was really focused on risk for triple, triple negative breast cancer. And that was expanded to include breast cancer in general, including triple negative breast cancer. And then with BRCA1 uh, and 2, in men with gynecomastia, consideration of annual mammogram at age 50 was um, included. And then looking at um, histologic sub, or pathologic subtypes for uh, breast cancer, there was some information included beyond what had been in there before about the breast cancer characteristics that are overrepresented in um, certain breast cancers among specific gene carriers. Um, of note, as I was looking through this, I noticed that subtype information for TP53 and P10 were, are not included in NCCN. And as uh, many people already know for uh, TP53, so, related to Lee-Fermeni syndrome, we generally see an overrepresentation of triple positive breast cancers. For P10, there have been some suggestions 
of a luminal subtype overrepresentation. But again, these are not in NCCN at this point. And you know, just to uh, give a plug in about our social media efforts, we know that getting bits of information is sometimes useful. So we have been um, posting on social media to kind of start going through what uh, the posting of these NCCN guidelines and uh, highlighting some of the changes. Now, you know, I just wanted to highlight, we had presented this last month, but with the NCCN guidelines, this is again, a moving target. And even on the clinical side, I'd say, we struggle with this as well, right? Because we counsel patients based on current guidelines, but these guidelines change over time. And I'll give you two examples, which to me, again, in our practice, we need to address these. NBN was downgraded during the last um, NCCN guideline update. Um, and it was, based on the data that is now has become available through larger studies compared to what the data had been based on before. So it's because the data has evolved. Um, and again, at this point, or before, we were recommending high-risk breast screening through mammogram, yearly mammograms and breast MRIs. We're no longer, that, that is no longer in the NCCM guidelines. BARD-1 is the opposite. There's emerging data that this is important as a high-risk breast cancer gene. So we did add consideration for high-risk breast screening through both an MRI and breast mammo, mammogram starting at age 40. And then, you know, just to show you, these are um, some cases that we pulled both from our practice or from eye care where, you know, we have, the first case is a 50-year-old uh, without a history of cancer, tested in 2016, pa pathogenic variant in NBN, and at the time we recommended annual breast MRI and mammogram. But again, the guidelines have changed. So as a practice, it kind of puts us in a position where, okay, what do you do now? The guidelines have changed, and how do you go back to the patients? Similarly with BARD-1, um, this is a patient we'd seen, with, or patient um, that we have with a strong maternal family history of breast cancer, and she came to us age 69 without a history of cancer. She was tested in 2018, BARD-1 uh, pathogenic variant, and at the time, we did not recommend any high-risk breast cancer management based on the gene mutation. Now, given her strong maternal family history, that would be another issue that, you know, she could get the high-risk screening um, based on that aspect of her history. But again, <clears throat> this kind of brings up, do we go back to this patient and talk about how the guidelines have changed? And I, I think these are important factors to kind of consider. And that's where I foresee, you know, tools, and I'm, I, we don't know if, my gene council will work, but those are the types of tools where you have this ongoing relationship with the patient to be able to push out information as, uh, as information evolves. Um, so just, again, highlighting the overarching issues and some of the factors to consider as we um, move forward with this type of work. <clears throat> 